I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country, the Aboriginal people of the many lands that we work on and their language groups throughout Western Australia and recognize that continu their continuing connection to the land and waters, remembering that Murdoch University stands on the ground of lunar countries. And I'd like to respect, to pay my respect to um, our uh, elders past, present and emerging. Now I'll go through to my short biography, which is here. You can see it, right. So I started in 1991, enrolling to med school, finished in 1998. Then I went on being not a forensic pathologist, meaning a doctor in morgues and doing autopsies. I specialized, uh, took my master in forensic anthropology, so I uh, switched from bodies to skeletons. And I practiced that in Italy for 15 years. In uh, 2018, I migrated to Australia with my family of this. This is one of the members. Then there I have another three cats and a partner, of course. And I became an adjunct lecturer in forensic sciences at Murdoch University, where I'm still working. And also I enrolled in a PhD. Uh, program because I wanted to study something about uh, marine archaeology um, connected to bones and bodies found in the marine environment. And since this year, a few, few months ago, I was uh, appointed as a research associate with the Western Australian Museum that uh, gave me and allowed me to use most of the, mater the material that I'm showing in my presentation. Because I have 49 slides, I would like to introduce maritime uh, history and archaeology. Like maritime history is the study of people and their activities in, on, around, and under the waters of the world from, for exploration, trade, and leisure. We have to remember that the indigenous people came to Australia some 65,000 years before present when they were allowed to cross the strait, uh, the Torres Strait up north. And so they arrived much, much before us here in Australia. And the maritime history in Australia starts with them. So maritime history incorporates a variety of different, different research disciplines like history, but also anthropology, archaeology, which is the one I'm focusing on today. Env environmental sciences, marine science and also legislation. It's also important to, uh, to highlight that marine, maritime history is also a pathway to study the world's history and especially some issues that are really interesting and uh, demanding for us all in this historical period, like ocean pollution, overfishing, and the level of um, the, the rising of the sea levels due to climate change that we're all experiencing. I'm just rushing here because I have 49 slides and I wanted I would like to show you some uh, interesting um, examples of shipwrecks and salvages. So we are talking about maritime archaeology, but before that it's archaeology and is a broad concept. Archaeology is a scholarly discipline which is concerned with the identification, description and interpretation, meaning the explanation of physical traces of past ways of life. Underwater, uh, archaeology shares the same stringent scientific standards because archaeology is a scientific discipline. And of course, in the case of underwater archaeology, diving skills are required and need to be certified. The certifications can be different. Usually people start with recreational certification and then uh, proceed on um, getting professional qualifications. The difference between them is usually the depth and the length of the diving session. Archaeological sites, I, I have given you some examples. On your left, we have a, an archaeological site on land. Then we have a map of an archaeological site. And on your right, then we have an underwater archaeological site. A site is a concentration of the material remains, like evidence, like things, about pe past ways of life, and they are concentrated in one specific place. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, any excavation, any archaeological project in, in either on land or uh, in marine environment needs project planning and project planning can be quite complex and long. Uh, it includes research design, fieldwork strategies, logistics equipment, how to record, to, photo, to get photos, to get videos, how to preserve the, mater the material once you recover it, and then the processing and the publishing and the storage and the organization of teams. It, it can take really months the, with the project planning, but of course, on the project planning, it depends all the future kind of investigation or excavation that you're going to, to perform. Safety is also important on sites. There are codes of practice. The diving operation should be controlled. The, there should be a potential, potential solution for any potential issue that can come out like physical problems. And then there must be someone who is certified in first aid, probably possibly more than one person. Psychological problems can arise in during excavations, even because they can take a long time. So people are usually out of their house. They are away for, for months on end. Of course, um, someone has to check on the diving techniques and diver certifications and also um, all general safety on the site, like where, where the electricity come from, where the drinking water come from, e heating if necessary, and also the possibility of slips, trips, fall, and the personal protective equipment, especially if you're working in the places which are possibly or potentially dangerous in terms of the materials you are excavating. Think about metals or wood. Um, also, legislation has to be uh, considered. I'm not going through all the legislation here, just to tell you that the problem of legislation of shipwrecks, meaning shipwrecks or wrecks of uh, airplanes, was uh, started in the 60s and then um, went on in the 90s. And only recently, like in 2020, for example, the underwater ruins of the, t the Titanic, that the, the big ship that everybody knows, which have been um, named as a UNESCO cultural heritage since 2012, were finally granted the protection of an international treaty, meaning that before then everybody could try to excavate it, which is absolutely impossible because it's very deep. It's like 400, oh, sorry. Um, it's like 4,000 4, meters under the surface of the sea in the North Atlantic, so it would have been very difficult, but still it wasn't protected. And the vessels and the aircraft that wrecked in the World War I and II are considered war memorials. So they should be, let's say, theoretically left in peace because they are considered like graveyards. Going on, uh, before starting any excavation on a project, it's very important to do historical research and historical research can be performed and achieved uh, not only in libraries, museum, public record offices, collections, either public or private, but also by eyewitnesses accounts. And some, of course, sometimes if the wreck that you're uh, investigating is very old, you won't find people talking to you, but you would find newspapers, clippings or um, reports or um, chance finds, for example, fishermen that get their nets stuck in a shipwreck that everybody's looking for and nobody has found. And that's how, hap how it happened in Western Australia for many of the shipwrecks that we're going to analyze. So let's say that the historical research can be classical, as I said, libraries and museums, but it can also be by chance or by interviewing people and looking for clippings. Then, of course, um, your findings should be recorded. It can be done in several, in several ways, usually pre-printed forms like this one are used on the top left. And then you can have sketches, stratigraphical diagram as the one in the center. Of course, you will need to get uh, samples of soil or water and of the objects, photos, videos, dialogues, meaning that everything has to be recorded, marked, tagged, numbered, because it has to be retraceable in the future so once you get to study it. And that's the reason why you should have a file archive or database system where your information is, record is recorded in an organized form 
and it should be readily available for the future, for future studies. It's very important to fix the position in the case we're talking about a wreck underwater because then it should be uh, easy to, to return there once you have decided or your team or your institution has decided which kind of investigation you're going to conduct. So the ways of fixing positions are several. You can have optical methods or electronic methods. The first ones are mostly used on land and you can see, for example, transits, compass, sextants, or theodolite. Theodolite, at first I thought it was a mineral, but it's not a mineral, it's this device here, so on top, and it gives you the triangulation of a position mm, through three points in space. Um, or the electronic methods like, like microwave shore station or GPS system or radar, and you have different examples that I put here in, uh, in pictures. They, are, they can be, of course, very complex. They can take time and there should be at least one expert in the, the excavation team that knows how to fix the position, even because it's very common that the first excavation is not complete and the team should come back maybe years later and they should be able to retrace the wreck where it was located the first time. Just one example of a GPS um, location, uh, RMS Titanic is in latitude and longitude, meaning latitude is, uh, um, sorry, latitude is in uh, parallel, so transverse, and longitude is in meridians, which is vertical. In this case, the first meridian is the one passing through, through Greenwich in the UK. And then if you go west, meaning that you go towards the United States, then you have west. If you go east, to, you go towards us, towards Asia. And, and with this latitude and longitude, we can locate the Titanic wreck, which is 41 and 49. So this is 40, 1 and 9 here. And that's where it is in the North Atlantic between Europe and America. OK, sorry. Nope. Search methods. Search methods can be even here uh, several different and with different degrees and stages of difficulty. There can be divers submersible with human eye or handheld equipment like the, 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 the photo you see on top where basically the diver uh, is towed by an electrical device. And they can have several names, the towered searches, swim lines, circular, or searches with the metal detector, meaning by hand, or by remote sensing surveys, which employ electronic equipment that is controlled above the surface. On the right, you have an example where you can have connection between GPS satellites. This is, uh, the, of course, the boat where the, there is the control room. And then you can have a sonar scan sonar, magnetometer, and all of it is combined to give you exactly the position uh, to find the, the, the shipwrecks that you are suspecting is there because you know, you know that by historical searches and that of course it gives you confirmation. In the remote sensing, you can have eco sounder, side scan sonars, magnetometer. You can also have aerial photography, for example, here, uh, the photo on your um, left in the middle, then you have the outline of the of the wreck, but of course it should be uh, then it should be confirmed by direct investigation. Or you can use remotely operated vehicles. They are called ROVs, and they're uh, they're directed from the surface. Of course, they're not manned. There's are no humans inside here, but only cameras and um, to take photographs and videos. And sometimes they also have operational arms like metallic arms that are used to, to take samples or to pick up objects if they're not too heavy, of course. The surveying underwater is very important because it's a pre-disturbance, meaning that before the excavation, there is a pre-disturbance survey that are essential first step in achieving a complete record of the site. So you get to know the site before you actually go there, either in person by diving or using ROVs. And the aim is to produce an accurate and detailed 3D record of the site before starting any disturbing excavation. 
Of course, you'll need some hardware like measuring tapes, chains, boards, and also some wet notes, meaning in the case you're diving, then you can write on these tables that where it's possible to write and read underwater to communicate with your fellow mates on the investigation and excavation in the case you're diving there. And then, of course, the surveying methods, as we say, triangulation, photogrammetry, underwater photography. In this case, um, in the, the lower the lower photo is of this uh, good friend of mine, um, very famous uh, maritime archaeological photographer, Dr. Patrick Baker. He is retired, lives in Hamilton Hill, close to where I'm living, and still works at the Shipwrecks Museum in Primentol. And he used to take photos of very important shipwrecks that we're going to have a look at shortly. The excavation itself is the act of discipline, meaning it doesn't have to be done randomly, but very orderly. Dismantling the context which form a site with the aim of explaining the origin of each layer of the site in relationship with the rest of the site. It's a destructive method because once you have started it, you have uh, altered the environment forever. Even if you try to put, to put the object in its place, something has changed. And so that's where we come to heritage care and site protection, the archaeological site and their historical legacy ultimately belong to the whole of the mankind. So it doesn't really matter where they, uh, they are excavated or investigated, they, are, they make part of the human history. So all archaeological sites need monitoring over time. Some of them need to be stabilized, sometimes nets are used, poles, and during recovery, so many precautions need to be used, like sometimes the filter fabrics are used or any other kind of protection of the objects and of the environment. The recovered material should be preserved and conserved. For an example, is in the case of underwater shipwrecks is desalination, meaning removing salts from the objects that have been um, submerged in, um, in salt water maybe for hundreds of years and suddenly they find themselves in exposed to the air. So that step has, has to be very gradual, meaning that usually um, the objects are submerged by fresh water with uh, decreasing uh, concentrations of, of salt until they have none anymore and then they have to be uh, left to dry in uh, um, a dark or semi-dark semi place. It, it, it all has, you know, all the steps of, to do, of doing this in order to preserve the objects. And then, of course, once preserved and conserved, the, the objects that you have recovered should be stored safely. The post-field work is about recording uh, the steps of the excavation, processing, analyzing, reporting, and publication, which is the ultimate goal of any scientific institution, is publish their work and show uh, their findings and the meaning of their findings. In this case, also communication is very important. Here, the lady that you see is a good friend of, and of mine, Paola and colleague, and she's not only a very fine scientist, but she's also a science communicator. This, for example, is one recent publication of her about the need of scientists to be able to communicate their findings and the interpretation of their findings. In her case, she had she won many prizes for at, uh, for science communication and she is now portrayed in one of the conferences she went to to explain exactly uh, the results that she had in her research. I'm not a science communicator myself but I'm lucky to have her as a friend because then I can try to look for some advice when, it, when my time comes. Communication is usually the presentation of your results in seminars, conferences, talks, informal presentation like the one I'm doing today with you displays or media, also social, social media, and also in education. Okay, let's go to famous wrecks. That's the nice part. Not the other one wasn't nice, but that, that the other one was scholarly. And this one is really about, you know, wrecks, famous wrecks. I listed some famous wrecks in order of time. 
meaning from the oldest to the most recent. So we'll start with the Mary Rose, then we'll move on to Batavia, Vergulde, Drek, Zurich, and Rapid, that are uh, four shipwrecks uh, of, on, of the Western Australia coast. And then we'll go through the HMS Erebus and Terror that uh, belong to the famous Franklin expedition, of which everybody lost any traces until a few years ago when the mystery was unveiled. The Titanic that everybody knows, even because maybe some of you have seen the terrifying movie that, that everybody has seen. And then not only on ships, but also the last two, the Zero Fighters and B-29 Bomber, they are aircrafts that, uh, that um, have been found as wrecks underwater after a few years when, after they crashed. So the Mary Rose, you can... It, uh, then you can see it's in uh, the south, it's, it's been recovered in the south of England. It was an English warship commissioned during the reign of Henry VIII. It was served as a flagship of the fleet and it sank in uh, 1545 and nearly all of the crew died because at the time they didn't have um, the emergency procedures that we have today in order to put people in safety when a sinking of course. So the Mary Rose was artifacts were recovered. Many, unfortunately, many human skeletons were recovered too. And the wreck site was extensively, extensively mapped. Uh, the wreck itself, so the ship, what remained of the ship, was raised from the seafloor some 40 years ago in 1982. And in 2013, after major conservation work, the Mary Rose went on display in the Museum of Portsmouth in the UK. So now we are going to have a look. Of, this is top left. You have uh, an idea of how it looked underwater. Then you have the salvaging operations. Then you have the restoration of the ship. Uh, top right, you have on the right side what actually remained of the ship, and, it, and which is actually shown in the bottom photo, where it basically you only have half of the ship, but then uh, it's been restored and preserved, and it's possible for visitors to have a look how, on how it actually was. Uh, Needless to say that all these salvaging operations are absolutely very costly and they need a lot of volunteers. So that could be one good way of starting a career in um, underwater archaeology by volunteering in expeditions. Then we come to the Batavia. The Batavia um, left Holland in the, in the 16, in 17th century. It was one was on one of the flagships of the Dutch East India Company or VOC. Um, it started a journey with a precious cargo of silver coins, antiquities. They also have a prefabricated stand on, stand, sandstone blocks for a portico that would have been erected at the gatehouse in Batavia, which is the modern Jakarta. There were 30, 341 people on board, not only officers and sailors, but also soldiers and a small group of civilian passengers, among which women and children that were accompanying the soldiers and the sailors. Unfortunately, on the morning of the 4th of June, 1629, the Batavia wrecked. It ran aground on Morning Reef in the Houtman Abrolos, which are um, an archipelago of island which is off Geraldton here in Western Australia. And it, it, Batavia is known to have been the first Dutch ship to be lost off the, uh, the West Australian coast. What happened after is a very sad story because these are some uh, paintings of that. So after the shipwrecks, uh, horrible crimes happened on the island where the, the crew and the civilians were marooned. And centuries later, 
uh, the, the, uh, the shipwreck of the Batavia was located, was salvaged. You can see one of the salvaging operation top left in, in this slide. And you can also see a good friend of mine, Dr. Sauter of the, the Shipwrecks Museum, while investigates with the metal detector close to the place where the, the Batavia sank and where apparently the crew found refuge when, of course, the, the ship sank and they had to, um, to reach the land in order to survive and they left behind so many artifacts that could be located also by metal detector and the um, complete wreck was salvaged and that's how it looks like today at the shipwrecks museum in Fremantle that if you haven't done that already I absolutely advise you to have a look at because it's amazing and that's the real one you know the real Batavia hull that's been Put, put together, recovered, salvaged, and restored. Another important ship that sank off the coast of Western Australia was the, was the Evergulde Drek uh, in uh, six, uh, 1656. This particular ship was important because it carried a cargo of trade goods and so many silver coins. It sank uh, off uh, the coast of Western Australia, north of Yan Chep, so between here and Geraldton. And a rescue mission was dispatched from Batavia, meaning the, from Jakarta at the time to find survivors, but no survivor was ever found. And the site was accidentally discovered in 1963. And unfortunately, it had been looted and damaged because, you know, the divers found the silver coins and probably there, are some, there is someone that has some of those silver coins in their house today. But then luckily, when the excavation took place a few years later, after the 1963, then so that was, sorry, on the on the left you have uh, the general appearance of the Vergulde Drek, and these are some artifacts that can be uh, observed and appreciated today at the Shipwrecks Museum in Fremantle. And here you have the silver coins that have been recovered and are quite valuable, not only from the historical point of view, but also because they were made of silver. The next um, shipwreck we are going to analyze here off the coast of Western Australia was the Zuik. It sank in 1727. It had uh, 208 people on board between seamen and soldiers. It ran aground in the Abrolos II, so close to where the Batavia ran aground one century before that. And in, the, in 1840, officers and crew of the British survey ship Beagle, uh, the, the famous one, the one that carried, um, I don't know, I have to, um, uh, landed on the island where the maroon sailors from the Zuig had camped and found numerous relics of the, their uh, camp and camp and camping. And subsequently in the years, so many other visitors found some artifacts that could have belonged to the survivors. And they continued to find finding um, artifacts all through the 50s and the 60s of the last century, while finally in the 16, 1968, the outside of the reef was searched for the main wreck site, which was finally discovered with, uh, and consisted of anchors and cannons. So a combined underwater and land survey was conducted by uh, the Underwater Explorers Club under the supervision of the Western Australian Museum and the real excavation began in the 1976, so more than 40 years ago, and that's a couple of Photos of this. this is one on the left. You have one cannon, which is all encrusted by maritime organisms. Um, top right, you have an idea of the general appearance of the ship. And down here, uh, bot bottom right, then it, then it was like a small ship that was built by the sailors. Once they were marooned, they recovered some woods from the, from the shipwrecks and they built this very small ship with which some of them tried to go to Batavia to, to look for help. A nice mystery that came out from the Abrolos Island, so where both the Batavia and the Zuik um, sank, is that some survivors of the Zuik in 1727 observed timber beams and wreck material washed up the islands of the Pelsert group, a group of islands in the, in the same Houtman Abrolos. 
in, in the last century, three expeditions of the Department of Maritime Archaeology of the Western Australian Museum went on the Zurich site. They also performed and achieved aerial magnetometer surveys in order to locate another shipwreck. In 2014, a brief trip inside the, the reef area was performed to obtain GPS position of objects, but no evidence of a different shipwreck has been found. So there is a suspicion that the other shipwreck could be nearby and it could be the Fortuin, which sank in 1724, or the Egg de Kerke, which sank in 1726. They were both ships of the Dutch, East, uh, Dutch India Company, the VOC, and they had they had they were they have been known to have been lost in the Indian Ocean. Nobody has located them so far, and it could be that they are around the Abrolos Island. Probably some of you will be the next generation of maritime archaeologists that will find them out. Everybody hopes for that. So the last, the last shipwreck on the Western Australia coast that I'm presenting to you today, it's the Rapid, which sank in 1811. Uh, it was an American traded, uh, trader and wreck on the northwest of the uh, coast of Western Australia. So it's close to Exmouth, Sauron. It's in the Ningaloo Reef. Uh, so what happened is the day after the wreck, the crew set fire to the ship because they would they would not want the wreck to appear above the above the water and to attract other ships that could have uh, salvaged the the cargo, the pressure car cargo that it was transporting. And it was a 2000, sorry, 200, 2000, 280,000 Spanish silver dollars carried on board. Most coins were salvaged during, during the months after the wreck. So the entire crew of the Rapid um, went on the on the boat uh, on the boat uh, to Java, and they reached Java alive, even though they survived 37 days at sea with very small rations of food and water. In 1978, a spear fishing group discovered the wreck, so that was completely accidental and chance discovery. The excavation was conducted between 1979 and 1982 and allowed the salvage of 20,000 remaining Spanish atrial coins that were all silver and had a very, they were very valuable, especially at the time, but they still, still they are valuable still today. The excavation provided a unique insight into the life on board of these fast ships. The ships fit in provision and the personal possession of the crew members had survived in a reasonable good condition on the side. So you'll have a look at how it looks. For example, this one, this one, the bottom photo is the bell, one of the bells of the wreck. We have um, the general appearance of the wreck on the um, left, top left, and then um, top right is one of the, the books that have been written on this story. We are now going to HMS Erebus and Terror. Um, from the map, you can see they have been both found both found on the no in the north of Canada, so in very very freezing environment. They were part of the Franklin expedition, an expedition that start that set sail from England in 1845. They were looking for the Northwest Passage, like a way to circumnavigate the North of America and get to the Pacific from the UK uh, across what is now the Canada's Arctic. In September 1846, the ships became trapped in the ice near King William Island in, uh, in the north of Canada. And what happened uh, after that is not, uh, there is no direct uh, report, it's just because of um, historical and archaeological investigation. By 1848, Captain Franklin was dead and the surviving men abandoned their, their still trapped ships. And this, these details were gleaned from a note that these people abandoning the ship left in a cairn close to the place. So, and you will see the note that was left. I will show it in a minute in another slide. So their apparent disappearance prompted a mass massive search that continued unsuccessfully for nearly 170 years until in, in the September 2014, the 
wreck of the HMS Erebus was located, and in 2016, the wreck of HMS Terror. They sank because basically what happened is that the ice crushed them. They sank where they had been abandoned, but of course the, the, the crew had abandoned them probably months or maybe weeks before they were cra completely crushed and, and, and they sank. This, this is a painting Top left, you have a painting of the situation, how it must have been in 1848 when the ship here that was um, um, crushed, uh, progressively crushed by the ice, was abandoned by people with sleds and dogs. This is one of the, st uh, the steps and the stages of the um, investigation and the excavation, and this is a, a kind of floating. Uh, habitat, and here you have the outline of the ship on your um, right photo. And this uh, bottom left is the note that had been left in the cairn. So, of course, the written um, parts uh, in the center are not really important. What's important is what on the margin, where the history, the story, and the history of those two ships was explained by uh, the, the crew that was abandoning the ships. Uh, unluckily, no one of that crew was ever found alive. Some of them were found dead, but not alive. So that's the reason why we don't have any first-hand account of this unfortunate expedition. The next one is the one that probably everybody knows better than anything else, Titanic. Titanic was uh, built uh, in in uh, at the beginning of the last the, the, the last century the 19th century, sorry, 20th, 19th, 21st or 20th century, and it sank in 1912 during a, 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 voyage, a voyage through the Atlantic. Uh, it was the maiden voyage, actually, and there were so many fatalities when it sank. It sank because it hit an iceberg, and then what happened is that, uh, I'll show you in a few seconds why, uh, it, had, it had to sink after hitting the iceberg. So that's the, the route that it followed from, from uh, um, Southampton to New York. Unfortunately, it never arrived in New York because it sank in, this, um, in, in the north of the Atlantic after the collision with the iceberg. Um, as you can see from the timeline, the first the iceberg was spotted at 11.35 p.m., and um, the collision happened soon after that. And yeah, the boat sank at 12, at, at 218 and the, 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 the Titanic sank at 220 completely. And the survivors were, uh, were rescued one hour later. And the, there were some, some like 1,500 people lost their lives in that unfortunate uh, occurrence. This is a painting of how it probably happened. So once the, the bow of the ship, oh sorry, the, yeah, the bow of the ship went underwater, um, the weight of the ship had it breaking in two parts. And that's how, how the, the bow and, and the, the half of the ship appears on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean at a depth of about um, 308,000 meters under, under the surface. So also that's another reason why it was so difficult to locate. And what's happening to the Titanic today is that the ship is um, uh, slowly decaying. So in, here we have the appearance of the shipwrecking 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, and that's uh, probably all that will be, all that will remain in 100 years from now. So that's why another reason why we, we said that um, underwater archaeological sites should be monitored also to understand how long it takes to lose this, kind, this kind, sort of testimony in years, in, in, over time. Now, the last two wrecks that I'm presenting to you are the Zero Fighters. Uh, an aircraft that, sa that sank in the Truck Lagoon, a beautiful lagoon in the Pacific in Micronesia. This is north of New Guinea. 
um, it was uh, they sank after a battle with the American uh, US the American Navy uh, during World War II. And in the Truck Lagoon, we, we, there are about 250 aircraft and 45 ships. So unfortunately, we have to say it's really a paradise for divers. This is one example of this, but another example can be found in this photo. So it's quite easy because probably Truck Lagoon is not that deep. So it's still possible to observe that. And the other one is the B-29 bomber in Lake Mead National Recreation, Recreational Area, close to Las Vegas in, um, in the US. This is Las Vegas. In 1948, a World War II era bomber crashed into Lake Mead, which is a massive res uh, reservoir uh, of water for those regions. It had a five-man crew, which evacuated into life rafts, and they were uninjured, luckily. But the wreck was discovered in 2001 and it was still remarkably intact, as you can see in the next slide. So this was original photo on your left, but then the, that's the appearance of the wreck today, which is absolutely, as you can see, it's possible to dive there with uh, your, um, your standard diving equipment. So it's not, probably not that, not too deep. Um, Maritime, or mar mar sorry, maritime archaeology and history uh, also needs research. So research can be performed on maritime history, on the locations uh, of shipwrecks and the techniques to find out the locations, the site excavations, techniques for conservation of objects and materials, collections like coins, swords, ceramics. Personally, I'm studying a collection of animal bone, meaning non-human bones. And also through academic courses and programs, there are certificates, diplomas and masters in maritime archaeology. One of them is probably held at the University of Western Australia here in WA. My personal research is conducted inside the Shipwrecks Museum. Or, or you can see the collections and, and the library here. And um, I'm researching on, as I said, non-human bones uh, from four different shipwrecks, the ones that I listed here. So the Batavia, the Vergul, the Drek, the Zuik, and the Rapid. And what I'm trying to find out if is if the long stay underwater has any in any way altered their uh, the material aspect from the physical, biological, and chemical way. So this uh, top left you have a CT scan of one of those um, those bones, and then we have some uh, sc scanning electron microscopy images when we can have on your um, middle uh, top middle we have demineralization so the mineral com component of the bone uh, is is gradually lost on your bottom left we have some inclusions like um, these are called uh, uh, framboids and are basically sulfur and comes from bacteria uh, center uh, bo bottom center we have foraminifera which are small fossil shells that nest through the cavities of bones and they only live in the sea. So in the case someone found a bone and had this kind of appearance, you, you can say that this bone comes from the sea and salt water. It can't be found in fresh water, for example. On your uh, top right, we have an image of a uh, of, um, scanning electric microscopy with chemistry so we have sort of elements that are composing not only the bones but also the inclusions and on the top sorry on the bottom right then we have some small tunnels that have been excavated by cyanobacteria um, at the bottom of the sea where they where they lay for in this case for hundreds of years what's what are the job opportunities for, for a maritime archaeologist. Oh, there are so many. You, um, it's possible to become a um, uh, archaeologist or an underwater archaeologist, a museum curator, museum conservator, which is not exactly the same thing because the museum curator um, 
deals with the archives and the filing of the of the objects uh, and the history of the objects whereas the conservator cons co preserves them so applies the techniques to preserve the objects from the underwater um, excavations uh, there is there are academic careers uh, careers have as historians as science communicators for um, heritage advisors journalists writers teachers and I can probably imagine also more. So there are so many different possibilities for any of your desires in, uh, in when you think of your future career. If you wish to know more, I have uh, this slide will probably remain with you. So I have a vast array of books, scholarly articles, and also popular articles and magazines talking about uh, maritime history and underwater archaeology. Uh, personally, I would suggest probably starting with uh, encyclopedia or books that give you a broad uh, overview of the of the topic and then if you wish to to know more of them then you can pass to on to scholarly articles which are a bit more scientific and technical and also the popular articles and magazines are also useful because even if they are not that scientific in their approach they can uh, spark some ideas because they inform you about things that otherwise you would never know, like, for example, the finding of new shipwrecks in other places uh, in the world. So that's all I have to say for today. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm, of course, here for questions, if you wish. And of course, I hope that I conveyed you my passion about shipwrecks, even though I have to tell you a secret, I'm not a diver myself but I have many colleagues who are, and so that's the reason why we are able to cooperate and publish about the, the topic. Thank you very much.